Hey everybody, it's good to be together again uh, for the study in Job. What an interesting book that's captured the imagination of people through the centuries. This man that has undergone so much suffering and so much pain and how he comes through that. And some, according to some scholars, 4,000 years later, we're still hearing the story, still trying to make sense of suffering in our lives. And that's what this journey is for us as well. How do we understand God? How do we understand suffering? How do we understand this world and our place in it? And so today we continue that journey. If you were with us last week, we saw a few things already. Uh, one, we, we learned or were reminded, I hope, that God is not the author of suffering. He is not the one that brings the pain and suffering into our lives. In the book of Job, it's very clear that the one who causes Job's suffering is the Satan, the adversary. And we learn that there are forces in this world, forces that are working against God and wanting to bring us discomfort, that are wanting to hurt us. Uh, just recently, I heard someone say, well, you know, God's just testing our faith. Well, I don't know about that. I think here Satan is testing Job's faith. And I wonder if not most times that we feel like we're being tested. It's not God testing us. It's Satan testing us. Another thing we see here as well is that, that Satan was in, intentionally doing these things to Job to test his faith. And we learn that God allowed this to happen because God has faith in us. He has confidence in us. He has confidence in his grace and his love that regardless of what we go through, we are not going to turn our backs on God. We're not going to curse God that we're going to remain faithful. And Job has shown us that he has done exactly that. The other source of our suffering is our own uh, bad decisions. Uh, we call it free will, that, that ability to choose in this world. And so sometimes we make bad choices. Uh, there's no reason for us to blame God. And, and, and when we make those bad choices, we can't even blame Satan. I know that, what's that saying? The devil made me do it. Well, sometimes our own uh, egotism, our own arrogance, our own selfishness makes us or leads us to do things, uh, our own decision. And the results are sometimes just life shattering and they're hard and leaves us brokenhearted and other people shattered and broken. But that's our decision. It's not God putting something on us. And so these are the things that we have, have studied and, and learned already. Uh, knowing where the suffering in our lives comes from helps us to live more faithfully, I believe. And so part of the reason we're doing the study of Job is to know where the suffering comes from. And we are reminded again and again throughout the, the, this whole book that, that Satan is the one doing this, not God. So are you ready? Are you ready to dive into another chapter? Uh, we're going to leapfrog over two. We're going to come back and talk about it. But I'm going to read, first of all, uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Uh, you can follow along or you can just listen. Here we go. After this, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish and the night that said a boy is conceived. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God, not ab may God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it that night. May thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered into any of the months. May that night be barren. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. Those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. May its morning stars become dark. May it wait for daylight in vain and not see the first rays of dawn. For it did not shut the doors of the womb on me and hide trouble from my eyes. Whoa! This is a man who's hurting. This is a, in literature and in the study of scripture, we call this a lament. That, that deep yearning pain, an expression of just, oh, so much hurt. And so here he is, and he's, he's crying out about the day he was born. Why was I even allowed to be born? If I was going to see this kind of suffering, how did this happen? I wish this day never was. Man, that's a whole different, uh, a whole different thing from what we heard when he first uh, suffered, right? In the beginning, do you remember those words he said? The Lord has given and the Lord takes away. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
wow, now he's, uh, he's got a little bit different tune. But some things have happened between the first chapter and the third chapter that we need to be aware of. You see, when Job lost his, his sheep and his herds and, and servants and his children, he did not curse God. And so Satan's a little upset. Satan goes back to God and says, yeah, yeah, I see this, but you didn't let me touch him. You didn't let me hurt him. And so Satan says in chapter two, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to his face. The Lord's not going to stretch out his hand and strike Job. Not going to happen. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Okay, and so the next thing we find out is that Job is covered in these painful boils that the scripture says that cover him from head to toe. Just painful boils. And we find him sitting in ashes with a, with a shard of pottery, <sighs> scraping the boils. <laughs> it's kind of gross. But here's a man who, who's lost his health and he's even lost his appearance. I'm sure that he just looks horrific. So much so that his wife comes to him and says, curse God and die already. Man, he's, he's in bad shape. If his wife comes and says, you have put up with enough of this. Just curse God and die. So first of all, we see that she too thinks that God has done this. And then Job responds to her and says, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And so still, Still, Job is convinced that everything that has happened to him has happened because God has made it happen. He does not realize that this is an act of Satan, of the evil powers of this world coming against him to test his faith. But wow, what an amazing trust and faith Job has. Imagine he's lost all of his wealth. He's lost all of his children. And now he's lost his health, and he still remains faithful to God. Golly, that's amazing. And it's wonderful, and it's an example for us. I don't know if we have looked at Job as being an example for us, but we need to realize that Job is an example for us to go through all the suffering. And all the time he thinks it's from God, and yet he remains faithful to God. Wow, that is amazing. The story goes on in chapter 2. Three friends arrive. Uh, they come to sit with him. Here's what the scripture says. Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon Job, and they set out from their homes, and they met together, together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. Remember what he looks like, right? And they began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes, and they sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Wow. Do you realize these three guys, they, they love their friend Job. They've traveled from their respective homes and they've come together by agreement. And when they're still afar off and they look and they see him, they can't believe what they're seeing. They look again and it seems impossible. This is Job. And it's, scripture says that they were so overcome with grief that they tore their clothes and they wept. And then they went and they sat with him for seven days. In this instance, and in this respect, these three friends become models for us as well. We have friends, family, neighbors, people around us who suffer. And one of the things that we can go and do is sit with them. Seven days and seven nights, they didn't say a word. Now, the lament covers like 10 verses in chapter 3. Job's lament. This day should have never happened. I wish I was never born. It's the most horrible day. Curse this day. It's, it's, said, it's 10 verses, but I have a feeling that, that in reality, Job probably 
cursed that day for the next 10 hours or the next 50 hours. It says that they said nothing to him. It doesn't say that Job didn't say anything. And they sat there and they saw how great was his suffering. And I, I imagine they sat there and listened to this because it's, it's after they sit down that, that Job's lament comes out. And so one of the things that we can do as God's people when we have people around us who are suffering loss, who are suffering pain, uh, you know, everyone's pain is their own. What seems like a small thing to us from the outside may be literally breaking the heart of someone else. Uh, losing something may seem like, oh, that was just a thing. But for the person who lost it, it may be a huge thing. And having someone just to go and sit and be with them may be one of the best things that we can do. And to sit there quietly, that may be good. Because what we find in Scripture is that as soon as these guys open their mouths, <laughs> it all falls apart. If they had just stayed quiet... <laughs> But no, here we have uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They begin to talk to Job, and they come with that same understanding of the world that Job has. And they're saying to him, Job, obviously you've got sin in your life. There's something you've done wrong, and if you will just get things right with God, God will restore you. All three of them, more than once in these next few chapters, come and tell Job, yeah, you know, it's really bad, but you know what? It's obviously because you are doing something wrong. Uh, there's sin in your life. And if you will just come and confess it, you know, it'll, it'll all work out. These guys think that if, if you're doing things right, then everything goes right. And if you're doing things wrong, everything goes wrong. And they also think that if there's anything wrong in your life, it's God doing it to you. They would say a hearty amen if they had been there when Job had said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. They would have said amen to all of that. So they've come with their, their different, twisted, the same one that, that Job has, idea that the suffering in the world is because we have somehow sinned. The people that come and say, well, it's, it's God's will. God's in control are basically saying everything that happens is, is God's doing. But, but I ask you, how do, we, how do we say that to the family whose granddaughter was at my parents' church uh, last year in vacation Bible school, running and playing? I believe she was around seven years old. And two weeks after VBS, somewhere in those two weeks, she had contracted this incredibly aggressive disease and died. Ah, uh, Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Really? Really? What do you say to that family? We remember the story. The, the family that was on the, the vacation of a lifetime, that dream at Disney World, and they were sitting, having, I believe they were having breakfast, and suddenly realized that their toddler was gone. And we learned that an alligator from the pond near the restaurant had snatched him. Ah, God's in control. Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You're really going to say that to the parents who have, have lost their child to an alligator? Uh, how, how do you say that to the families in our community who two or three weeks ago Husbands, fathers that are police officers responded to a call and they're shot dead. And we say to them, God's will. Really? We are going to somehow put that onto God? No. No. You know, blame, blame problems with medicine. Blame a lack of signage around the world. Blame crazy people. Blame anything. Blame Satan. But no, we're not going to put that on our God who loves us and cares for us. How can we say that to someone who's going through suffering unimaginable? And yet that is what these friends come to say to Job. You've lost all your wealth. You've lost your family. You've lost your health and your good looks. God's doing this to you. You've sinned. You better get yourself right, and then everything will be fixed. 
uh, one of the, the problems that we see in this is that the three friends spend a lot of time talking to Job about God. They spend a lot of time talking to Job about God. But I wonder, did they ever step away or step back and talk to God about Job? Did they take time to pray and say, God, your servant Job is here, our friend. Bring healing, bring wisdom. Give us the words to say. I don't think they did that. I think that they were, were dead set on their own understanding. How different it might have turned out if they had spent time talking to God about Job instead of just talking to Job about their own misguided understanding of God. In the last parish that I served, uh, I remember clearly one of the, the dear ladies in our congregation, uh, I'll call her Susana. Susana was, was going into the hospital uh, and it was an emergency surgery. Uh, she called me on Thursday, Pastor, I'm at the hospital, they're gonna do surgery tomorrow. I went to see her at DHR and uh, she said, now tomorrow morning surgery, promise me you're gonna pray, Pastor. Of course I'm gonna pray. The next morning when I got up, there was a message. It was before she went into surgery and she said, please, please put on social media that I'm going into surgery, I want more people praying for me. <laughs> yes, yes, that is, that is exactly right. Instead of me going and, and, and everybody else going to her and talking to her about God, we talked to God about her. She came through the surgery, thanks be to God. And, and, and she was so grateful. So yes, let's go sit with our friends, go be with our friends, and, and maybe we can offer words of encouragement. But if we really don't know what to say, man, we can always talk to God about our friends. We can always share with God about our friends. So, so that brings us up to where we are in, in chapter three. Job is, is there, he's crushed, he's lost it all. And he, he goes into this lament about the day he was born, how it was just the it needs to be wiped off the calendar. It needs to be a forgotten time. Never remembered anymore, ever. Please just, ah! How do, we, how do we react in our suffering? Because what I see here in Scripture is, is Job is expressing true grief. Too often, I think, we, we've been fed this line that, that if we're Christians, then we have to wear a smile. How are you? Oh, everything's fine. Everything's great. And behind that smile, there's brokenness and darkness and emptiness. And yet we've been told that we're supposed to smile. Yeah, everything's great. Lost my job, but you know, God's in control. Yeah, still thinking God made you lose your job. You probably didn't show up on time. I'm kidding. I don't know what it is. But the point is, Job expresses his frustration and his anger and his hurt and his grief and he again becomes an example for us in that it is okay, better than okay. Our psychologists and psychiatrist friends will tell us it's important for us to voice the anger, the hurt, and the grief in our lives. And Joe gives us this example. I had a friend, a colleague that was on mission service with us outside the U.S., he underwent a, a mild heart attack. It was scary. It was, it was scary, and, and they were so far from the U.S. And, and from what they felt like were adequate health care systems, and yet the day he showed back up to work, everything was smiles and happy. And he had told me and my wife earlier how frightened and scared they were. Why could they not simply say, we are, we're really scared? Now, we trust God. We know that our lives are, are in God's hands, but, but we're really scared. Why is it that we as, as believers can't simply, like Job, take a moment and say, because his friends are there. He's not just speaking to God. Job is speaking for his friends and for God and for anyone else who will listen. He is taking time to express his lament, his pain, his deep anguish. Job teaches us that we can 
respond and express our pain and our anger and our hurt and our sense of loss. It is okay to express it. God loves us. And if the friends around us love us, they will hear it too. And they were silent and let him do it. Don't be that friend when somebody is having a bad day that says, oh, it's going to get better. Just smile. And no, let me, let me be angry for a little while. Let me hurt for just a little while. Let me be so incredibly ticked off for just, just let me do this for five minutes and stand there silent before you say anything. Don't tell me, oh, you've got to smile. Put on your best face. Chip her up. It's all going to be good. And you know, it, it probably will be. It probably will get better. But Job shows us that it's okay to have a moment, a season, a time where we say, this hurts. This stinks. I am dying on the inside. We have to be able to say that out loud, to express the pain. <sighs> Let's try to be that for each other in this world. Let's try to let people express their grief. We don't want to park there. If you look at the story of Scripture, everyone in Scripture that's of, of any significance, the great prophets, Moses, Abraham, Paul, even Jesus goes through that time. Jesus in the garden, Lord, let this pass from me, sweating drops of blood. The Father didn't say, hush, hush, put on a happy face, you're going to do this. He allowed him to have that. And the disciples allowed him to have it. And we need to allow each other to have those moments of grief. We don't want to park there. None of the great uh, examples from Scripture park in that grief, but they are allowed to have the moment of grief. Let's allow each other that moment of grief. In the New Testament, Jesus encounters suffering. And, and what you'll find is that even though we're in Job, uh, I don't think that a, uh, a Bible study is going to pass that we don't see what Jesus has to say about things. Uh, he is the final answer for me and everything that I come to in this world. So let's look at what Jesus says about suffering. In the Gospel of John, chapter 9, in verses 1 through 5, there's this interesting interchange between the disciples and Jesus. I'm going to read those uh, verses for you from John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. As Jesus went along, he saw a blind man from birth, <laughs> and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Yeah, you see, they, they call themselves disciples of Jesus, but, but these guys are still disciples of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They're still disciples because they're convinced that if there's, if there's something wrong in his life, somebody did something wrong and God is punishing him. They are still in that same mode of thinking. We wouldn't, shouldn't be surprised because in the 21st century, there's still people who think that way. And Jesus' reply is very clear and also incredibly insightful for us. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed. Oh, man. So this has happened. Something in this broken world has caused this man to be born blind. But look at what's going to happen. As you read on through that, that chapter of John, it's a wonderful chapter. There's lots of back and forth, the blind man and, and the Pharisees and all kinds of stuff. But Jesus heals the blind man to reveal the power of God. And so what we find often in this world is that it is a world in which we find suffering. We find that, that brokenness that, that is a part of all of our lives. But what happens is God uses those times of brokenness to reveal God's self, to reveal God's power. Often God has our attention more when we are in those moments of brokenness. When we're going through those hard times, God has our attention and, and can work more in our lives. Any of us who've ever been sick know that that's true, right? Um, we were living in Venezuela and uh, I'd been into the, the state of Barinas and to the city of Barinas, and we were looking at, at a mission that was growing in that area. Samuel, my right-hand man, went down with me. The first day we got there, at the beginning of the week, because on a Monday, we were out with people all day long. We went to open-air service, and this is, this is near the river area. There's lots of water, lots of mosquitoes, 
And, you know, we were all getting eat up, but it was so great. It was fantastic. We were having a marvelous time with praising and worshiping and studying the scripture with the folks of Barinas. And San Juan and I stayed through, the, through that week. And towards the end of that week, uh, the day we got up to leave, I got up and I thought, ah, I feel a little achy. And uh, I was feeling a little bit warm. And we had about a four-hour drive. And I started driving. And the more I drove, just the more tunnel vision I got and the more I began to just feel uncomfortable and in heat. And when I got home, one of the pastors that lived near us in Parquisimeto came over and he looked at me and he said, John, you got dengue. I was like, what? He says, you got dengue. You're sick, man. And he was right. I got dengue fever. And folks, if you've never had dengue, I pray you never have dengue. But you know what happened? Your body just aches. They call it bone break fever because it hurts so much. And my prayer life went from a four to like a 10 <laughs> in two days. And by the end, I wasn't quite ready to curse God, but I was saying, God, you know what? I'm ready to come home. I'm ready for the pain to stop, please. But God didn't cause dengue fever. And God certainly didn't cause me to get dengue fever. But you know what? God was there when I got it. And he used the seeds of prayer life planted in my life already. And he lifted my prayer life up to the next level. Wow. And so what we find is that in the horrors of this world, in the suffering that we go through, God steps in and uses those times of suffering to bring us closer to himself or to show us and reveal to us more about himself. And one of the things that God reveals here in the book of Job is that he is not the source of our suffering. He is with us as we go through this. And of course, right now in the midst of COVID, we're looking around going, what in the world? Those of us who are on staff here at the church, we're at, you know, how do we do church? How are we to be the church in the midst of all of this? And we're, we're having to think outside the box. Just uh, this morning, I was in a conversation with uh, Veronica, who's on staff here with us. And we were talking about this COVID and, and what's going to come of this. And, and we both agreed that the church at the end of all of this is going to be stronger than it has ever been before. Not, not this church. Yes, this church, but the church. The church is going to be a different organism. It's going to be a different body after we get through this time of COVID. We are being forced to do things in new ways. We are being forced to look at things in different ways. It is changing everything. And we can sit and go, oh, poor us, it's COVID. Oh, I'm hurting. And, and there are those moments when we, we get up in the morning and we go, why? And we express our grief and then we get to it. But I'm convinced, I am convinced that God is going to work through this COVID and bring about something that is absolutely amazing. So God worked through the young man's blindness in the Gospel of John. He worked through God, through the young man's blindness to open the spiritual eyes of the people that were around, especially those of his disciples, to help them see that his blindness was not a part of uh, a result of his sin or his parents' sin, but that God was going to use that blindness to reveal something about himself. Wow. Folks, Job is teaching us so much. Here we are in the second study together. And, and here are all the things that we have learned so far. I've got them, I got them listed here. We've learned that suffering and the hurt and pain of life are not gifts that God gives us. They are just bad stuff in our life that's caused somewhere else. So we need to quit blaming God. Number one, let's quit blaming God for all the suffering in our lives. Number two, there are very real spiritual forces arrayed against us, especially as God's people, who want nothing more than to see us fall, to want nothing more than to see us curse God, to shake our fist at God and walk away from the church and from the faith and from the Bible and say, God, if you're doing this to me, God's not doing this to us. There are spiritual forces arrayed against us. The devil, Satan, spiritual powers, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're real. The scripture talks about them. And there's also our own foolishness, that gift of free will. And it is a gift because without free will, we couldn't love God. There's no, God wants us to, to turn to him intentionally and to love him because we want to, not because we're robots. 
And so God has given us that, that freedom to choose. And there are times we just make bad decisions. Like when my friends and I, when I was just uh, seven years old, we decided to have the Kiss and Tire team where we would ride up along next to each other and I would touch my front tire to his back tire. And it made a great little noise and we we're gonna be the Kiss and Tire team. And I have a scar on my knee to this day, about this long, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, uh, he tapped me a little bit too hard and boom. Uh, God didn't do that, Satan didn't do that. I was just silly boys and uh, I suffered because of it. God doesn't cause our suffering. There are real things that do cause our suffering. Our friends can be an amazing source of comfort. It's our third thing. Our friends can be an amazing source of comfort during our times of suffering, to go and sit and be with. Those who are suffering is a gift that we can give to those who have lost, to those who are brokenhearted, to those that are, are struggling. Just being present is so important. The fourth thing is when we go and be with friends, let's not forget to talk to God about our friends. We can talk to our friends about God. That's good. We do need to share the faith. We need to share our own story. If we have a similar uh, experience of suffering and how God brought us through it, yes, that, that's great. But let us not neglect talking to God about the friend who's suffering. And the fifth thing that this passage has shown us is that when we're in pain, it is okay to cry out. It is okay to scream. It is okay to cry. It is okay to hurt. It is okay to have a time and a season of just expressing our frustration and all that's going on inside our hearts. Job shows us that. And then the last thing that we saw today is that God will work through suffering to bring out something new, to bring out something different. Now, the first time I, I, I brought this, this chapter of Job was in a pulpit some years ago, and it was Communion Sunday. And so when we finished the sermon, we did communion afterwards. And so we had to come to the table. And as we came to the table, I realized Jesus was crucified. Now, according to the twisted theology of Job's friends and of too many people today, Jesus suffered because God did it to him. And it was to teach him or discipline him, because that's what people tend to say. God punishes us to teach us or discipline us. And yet, when we look at Jesus, we know that none of that was going on. We know that none of that was going on. We know that the Romans and the Jews crucified Jesus, the Jewish leaders crucified Jesus. They were threatened by him, and they, they crucified Jesus. And that when Jesus was on the cross, he suffered. Oh, he suffered. Now, God knew that this was going to happen. God knows everything. And God knew also that through this suffering, God was going to change the world and enabled us all to come to a saving knowledge of God. Because in the Son is the perfect image of the invisible God. Paul taught us that last week from Colossians chapter 1. So when we look at covid and we look at the madness of our lives. And maybe, maybe COVID hasn't affected you. Maybe there's other stuff in your life that's bringing about suffering. Uh, we need to remember, God's not the cause of this. But God is the one who can work through the suffering of our lives to bring us to more beautiful places. To bring us to new places. To, to lift us up. To reveal something even just about who God is. That we would have a deeper understanding and a deeper relationship with God. Wow. Job. <laughs> what a book, right? Uh, if you have time, sometime this week, go back and, and read chapters one through three and, and, and see what's happening in there. If you want to go farther and hear some of those conversations that uh, uh, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar have with Job and the things that they say to him, they're like, you, you'll be standing back going, these are his friends. God, I'd hate to see his enemies. Uh, some of the things they say and he responds and they respond. Uh, it's a great, great interaction but let's take with us the things we've learned. Take with us the things we've learned. God is good. And everything good comes from God. God loves us. And he's with us through the suffering. Thank you all for being uh, with me again. If you want to leave comments, if you're seeing this on Facebook in the comments, leave me, leave me some 
some questions, some comments, I'd love to hear from you. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, once you're through, leave some comments below. I'll, I'll respond as best I can. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Invite someone to join you next week as we continue to study uh, Job through this journey of suffering. Take care. God bless.